Good morning everyone. I hope you're gearing up for a great week this week. I just want to strengthen you today in your faith and carry on from last week where we talked about the Holy Spirit coming into our world, into our lives and uh, you know we repent of our sins, believe in Jesus, be baptised in water for the washing away of our sins and the, the burial of our past and then uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit and every believer in the New Testament had gone through all four of those things and it led to the fifth thing and this is known as the initiation process of becoming a Christian. Initiation uh, or becoming a member, if I can put it like that. Uh, I, I did that with my face because often membership of a club, the church is not run like the membership of a club, it isn't. Uh, uh, but I'm just saying, uh, you know, we are members of the universal church but we have to become members of the local church because how can you be accountable to the universal church? Uh, you can't. And you know, I meet people from all over the world and it's great when you meet somebody from a different nation but they've had the same experience of the Holy Spirit that you have. And you're like, it's just amazing. We're brothers and sisters and God is, is recreating a whole new human race that are unified in Jesus that uh, you know, our, our commonality is faith in Jesus. And uh, that's how it was meant to be, right from the beginning, from Adam and Eve. But um, anyway, I want to get into this because the early church were, was filled with the Holy Spirit. 120 ordinary believers got filled with the Holy Spirit and spread the gospel right around the world. And you know what? It's, it's still going on today. Uh, and I find it amazing. So we need the power of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, it says, let me go into Acts chapter 2. And um, it says this, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Um, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. That's important. The Holy Spirit filled, baptised every one of them, 120 people. But it was like uh, you know, a tongue of fire on everybody's head. He filled them individually. So they all had their own personal experience of the Holy Spirit. And often we talk about, have you had a personal experience of Jesus? But really, what we're talking about is a personal experience of the Holy Spirit. He's the, 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 the part of the Godhead that we relate to now. And uh, let me just finish this scripture. It says, all of them, all of them, it says, tell somebody today, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit enabled them. This is not like you've got to learn French or German. This, this was a, a, a language given to them. And they had to practice it and it was, it, it formed. And God's still doing that today, giving people when he's, when you're filled with the Spirit, often he will give you that gift of praying in another language. It's a prayer language. When you don't know what to pray and you can start to pray in your prayer language and it's, it's helpful. Um, supernatural. So I don't expect you to understand it. I don't understand it, but I love it. I live in the good of it. I don't understand electricity. You've heard me say this before, but I live in the good of it. I can have a hot shower or I can have a hot drink. I can have a hot room. It's fantastic. But the point is, the early church, every one of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, people in, in the surrounding area said to uh, said to each other, they're drunk, they're drunk. And Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and he said, these people are not drunk. No, no, no. What you're experiencing is what the prophet spoke years ago that God would do. He is pouring out his Holy Spirit on all flesh, on your sons and your daughters. So, you know, you're coming in a patriarchal kind of society where it was male dominated, but God promised. He says, I won't just give me all the spirit to the men. I will give me all the spirit to the women as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just beautiful. Just beautiful thing. But, you know, anything God asks us to do, it's usually impossible. And, uh, it, but he gives us his Holy Spirit. 
the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had in John chapter 3 verse 34. It says that Jesus had the Holy Spirit without without measure, without limit. It was like, and we need the Holy Spirit if we're going to do what Jesus has commanded us to do in terms of his mission. What's his mission? Luke chapter 4, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me because he has empowered me to preach good news to the poor and uh, uh, to heal the sick, restore the sight of the blind, to release those that are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. The Lord's favour is awesome because when God's with you, doors open. I don't, I don't, I don't mean literal doors, but opportunities come your way that you could never have imagined. And you're like, God, this is incredible. Your life, find you, you'll find the super being put on your natural in your life. It is, it's just fantastic. And yeah, some days are just humdrum. You know, you you're just going. But you know, you can you can change them humdrum days in. Start singing a song to Jesus. Start singing. You know, just you know, you can get happy if you want to be happy. If you choose to be sad, that's up to you. But you, you know, you start to have this new life in Christ, and it is fantastic. So every believer needs to be baptised in the Holy Spirit and then each day to go on being filled with the Spirit. And in Acts chapter 4, twice on two occasions it says, and Peter filled with the Spirit. So and later on, Peter filled with the Spirit. It's an ongoing thing because as we keep being filled daily with the Holy Spirit, things inside of us will change because the, the Holy Spirit's active. And he convicts you sometimes of what you've said to somebody or how you're treating somebody or a bad attitude or something that's gone sour. And he conviction says, I don't like that. Come on, I can release you. Give it to me and I'll release you from it. Isn't it funny so often we don't want to release even our sins? You know, God will set you free from your enemies, but not your friends. And when we make sins our friends, <laughs> it doesn't help us. The Holy Spirit just waits. He doesn't force himself. He disciples us at our pace. So if you're frustrated with yourself today and the way you, you, your Christian life, your life is, then it's like, have a look on the inside and see where, where have you compromised? What, what are you doing that you know the Holy Spirit doesn't like? And turn, repent, because you know how to do that now. And everything you need to do really has, has been involved in your initiation process. Repent, go on believing, you don't have to get baptised again in water, so that's good, but you live in the good of it. When you're tempted, you can turn around to Satan and say, I'm dead to this. You were at my funeral. I got buried in water. And so, have you ever tried to tempt a dead body? <laughs> you get its attention, you can't, because it's dead to what stimulus you're trying to put there. And it's the same with you and me. We are dead to the old ways. And we're alive to Christ. But you see, the old ways are still with us if we allow them to be. And you have to choose daily to be filled with the Spirit to move on with it. So we, we live in power, not just like muddling along. There's, there's power from the Holy Spirit available to us every day. The Holy Spirit gives us power, but he gives us assurance as well. Assurance that we're right with God. And you know, when we sin, the first thing to leave us is that assurance. And it's not because God's left, it's because he's waiting for us to repent. And uh, I'm speaking to somebody today, you need to repent. Repent is good. It's turning from your, your, your sad, sorry, sinful life into God's dynamic future. That's what it is. And, you know, my sad, sinful life, don't take it personally. You know, as I turn from that, I come into God's dynamic life. And I want that. You know, transformation is another thing that the Holy Spirit brings. And the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 7 talks about what it's like before you're a Christian. He says, the good I would, I don't do. The bad that I, I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And he says, I realise there's nothing good that lives in my sinful nature. You know, when people think that they're innately good, we are not. We are all sinners. And we've been spoiled by sin and soiled by sin. But here's the thing. He asks the question, who will save me from this body of death? And he says, I thank God for Jesus Christ. 
And in the next chapter, chapter eight of, of the book of Romans, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because uh, the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. In other words, we don't have to live in, oh, I know what I should be, but I'm not. Oh, I know what God wants me to do, but I just don't do it. No, no, no. No, when you fill with the Holy Spirit daily, that, that word is important, daily. You, 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 you're coming like an express train against your sin. And you're like, no, I'm not having this anymore. I can be free from this. Roman 8, Romans chapter 8 says, I can be free because the spirit of life, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. And you know something? When you're not being filled with the Holy Spirit, I should say, when there's a neglect to, to asking God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, there's only sameness, there's no creativity. There's, there's, no, there's no life and flourishing. There's just death. Even though you say, well, I'm a Christian. Yeah, but you're not going on being filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and so it's gone, it's gone mouldy, is your life. It's gone dead. And there's nothing new, uh, creative in your life. There's no energy there. There's no life. I'm speaking to somebody today and it's because you're not going on consistently being filled with the Holy Spirit like the early church was. And you know what, what, what we're reduced down to is we go back to our sinfulness and there's no satisfaction. And you just think, well, Christianity doesn't work and it doesn't unless you cooperate. And when you do cooperate, you're living the good. Listen, I don't all, always get out of bed like this, alive and energised. But I have a coffee and, I, and I, I, I wobble my head and I ask Jesus to fill me with his Holy Spirit again. And I walk in the Holy Spirit. I ask the Holy Spirit to give me wisdom. And I said, Lord, fill me with joy. Fill me with your joy. Regardless of my circumstances, fill me with your joy. And you know something? When he does, it's like zippity doo -dah. And, you know, you've got a zippity doo -dah in your in your spirit. If you're from another nation, there is a song. And it's like from Walt, one of Walt Disney's films. Zippity do da, zippity a, and you know, my oh my, what a wonderful day! <laughs> Something like that. Plenty of sunshine going my way. I'm auditioning. Zippity do da, zippity. <laughs> and it's, and, and it, let me put it in, 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 in other terms. Put some Tamla Maltown on, and you start to get you like you get in the groove, and you're like you 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 you're going again, and you we, we lose the dynamic. Please don't stand there every morning and say, Holy Spirit, fill me. He's never going to do that. You, as you work, as you go, he goes. And all of a sudden you start to, you know the difference. And it's fantastic. Daily being filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the early church, they were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. People thought they were drunk. Peter had to preach to them and say, no, this is a promise from the book of Joel, the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. But also, this Jesus who you crucified, God had anointed to do all the miracles amongst you. You saw him and you saw these miracles and yet you crucified the author of life. You crucified the Lord of life. And the crowd were cut to the heart, the Bible says, and they said, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptised, every one of you, for the washing away of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And 3,000 people got baptised that day and they received the Holy Spirit. And that was awesome. What's the next movement right at the end of chapter 2 of the book of Acts? It says 3,000 were added to their number. Whose number? The church's number. How many were in the church? 120. That's church growth. I don't know what percentage it is. But 3,000 now need discipling. Now need to have the scriptures explained to them. And, and helping them, you know, you, 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 you walk, you took to, to walk in the Holy Spirit for the rest of their lives. 3,000 of them. How did they do it? They met in their houses. And the 120 had to spread themselves out. And where there were problems, then the, the, the 11 apostles, well, they, they added a, a, a 12th one. They would go around and help sort things out and, and, and bring, you know, the scriptures and bring teaching and, and direction to people. But, but the Holy Spirit, when he, when he filled the early church, he led them into mission. And then when people became believers and got baptised on that same day, he led them to create church. 
the, the, the Holy Spirit birthed the church. It's like he birthed the physical Jesus, you know, when he, he overshadowed Mary him and, and the shadow of the Most High. The Spirit will come upon you, Mary, and, and the shadow of the Most High will overpower you. Not, not overshadow you, not overpower you. <laughs> Sounds a bit creepy. But, you know, out of that Mary, a virgin, you know, would give birth to Jesus, the Messiah. But the, it was the Spirit that, that created that. And it's the Spirit that creates the church. He, he, he propels the church in the power of God all the way through. And, uh, you know, we now, even today, 2,000 years later, are being propelled by the Holy Spirit. The question is, is, are you? Is your dinner party, our connect group, is it being propelled by the Holy Spirit? Because church isn't just about a service, a meeting on a Sunday. It's about sharing your life. You read 1 and 2 Thessalonians, and Paul says, you know, we loved you so much, we didn't just share the gospel with you, we shared our lives. And he said, you know what, the gospel rang out from you. And he knew what a church that church must have been. And he said, we shared our lives with you. And he said, you know, anyway, it, it, they loved him so much and he loved them and they knew it. And it, it, it's, it's, it's fantastic when churches are birthed, new churches. And I want the gospel to ring out from global churches all over the world. There are many, many, many brilliant churches now, many. And I couldn't say that 40 years ago, but I can say it today. There are many, and they are relevant. And, you know, we've got to learn to get on with each other. Because in church, you don't choose the people that go there. They come. And, you know, when God sends them, then we're there to, we have to, you know, they're part of us. Now, and I'm going to look at that because, you know, when the rub you know, sometimes we'll say, you rubbed me up the wrong way. Well, in church, we can't have the wrong way to be rubbed up. <laughs> but that's the process, moving from irritation to being able to handle it and handle people well. And that's a process. That doesn't come overnight. God doesn't wave a magic wand and all of a sudden we all love each other. That's not what happens. But I do want you to know that it's possible to love people that you initially didn't like or initially you would never get on in a million years. And it's the same with the disciples. Jesus chose Ma Matthew, the, the tax collector, and Simon, the zealot. They would have hated each other. and But he, they were part of Jesus' crew and they had to learn to get on. We've got to learn to get on. And uh, I've written a few things down here, um, you know, about uh, about church. We, we, have a, we have 12 values in my church and... Uh, you know, four of them in relation to other people. It's this real, relevant, relational and robust. We're not easily offended, but we have to work at that. But we're real. That means we're honest. And I don't just mean spouting your mouth off and telling somebody what you think of them. That's too clumsy. You, you can't really go and tell somebody what you think about them until you've built some sort of a bridge to them. That they know that you're not against them. And if that bridge isn't strong enough, don't take it. You know, you've got to build a bridge of, of kindness and, and, and uh, relationship is probably a better word. You've got to build a relationship that's strong enough to take truth. You can't handle the truth. There's a film going through my mind. But church has nothing to do with denominations. They really come out of church splits and church divisions down the centuries. It's never really God's will. Jesus said, I've got one church. And he has just one church. That's how, that was his in, intention all along. But um, in church, we, we have to go in all in, wholehearted commitment. And, you know, churches can remain small because not it's not always our fault. We always think it's our fault as a church. What can we do to make church more interesting? And when we talk like that, we talk more about services. That's what we're thinking. But it's not always about us. If you look at the prevailing culture, people don't want commitment anymore. They don't want to give commitment. They, they don't want to be part of a team, church team. They, they want to do their own thing. They don't want to, they don't want to follow uh, uh, what the Bible says or, or the Holy Spirit's leading. It's like, no, I want to lead my life. And so it isn't just our fault. 
You know, God can offer us eternal life and people can walk away like the rich and ruly did. And they walk, they walk, you walk from Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That was his question. He was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. He had everything going for him, but he knew there was something missing. And he said, what do I have to do to get that something? And Jesus said, it's simple. Go sell all you've got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me and you'll have riches galore. You'll have eternal life. And it says, the Bible says he went away sad because he, was, he had great wealth. And Jesus wasn't having a go at wealth. Jesus uh, is not against us being wealthy, quite the opposite. That's what he wants us to be. But it's not about us having wealth. It's, it's about wealth having, having us. And it's when, it's when you're chasing money. And it's money, money, money all the time and nothing else. And it's like, that's not a life. That isn't a life. And maybe I'm speaking to somebody today and you see Jesus, Jesus' idea of all in is nothing before him. Have him as number one. And honestly, wealth and riches will come your way, they will. But, you know, it's, and that's not automatic, but the scriptures can show you how to live in such a way that when God's favour comes, you know how to handle it and you know how to manage it, manage the miracles that come your way. Some people get miracles and just squander them. But others manage the miracles. Anyway, I digress. We have to learn in church to relate. That's a process. I love that word, process. When I first became a Christian, I wanted everything to be a miracle. Uh, bam, bam, bam. Because like, come on, let everybody see how powerful God is. But I realise some of the most powerful things are is, is where we work things through in process. And uh, there's principles that we can employ. So it's not magic. So when it's not going right, we can look at what principle's missing or, or where we're overlooking something or we've forgotten something. You're like, ah, we need to go and put that right and then the principles will work. Um, the Bible talks about holding together. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says to the church, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. It's an effort. It's like building a family. It's easy to argue and, and, and find fault with each other. It's difficult to keep the unity of the spirit. And let's, you know, find the 1% that you do get on and give it 100% commitment. Find the 1%, that's all you have to do. Um, and we, we have to learn these things. Love is the cement. And I'm not talking about uh, sentimental love or anything like that. But love where we can speak truthfully and honestly with each other and and they know that you're not just having a, a go at them. And you know they're not just having a go at you. That they're seeing things and they're saying, this isn't helpful. Can we talk? Can we grab a coffee or a beer together? And, and uh, you know, let's talk about some things. Romans chapter 5 verse 5 says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And it's the love of God that helps us to love people that we don't naturally get on with, that we don't naturally hang out with. Um, love will be tested. You need to know that. Love will be tested. You'll offer love to people. It can be rejected. I've been rejected <laughs> so many times. <laughs> but it's not, this is not romantic love. This is where you've helped people. You've encouraged them. You've led them to Christ. You've baptised them. You've, 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 you've married them. To, you know, they've found a partner in church and you've married them. And then they just disappear. They just walk off. And you think, what were all that about? But I realise that not everybody that comes to my church should stay at my church. And I like to be free at letting people go. And because uh, if they don't want to be here, I don't really want them to be here. I can only build with people that are committed. Yeah. Um, because I want to, I, I want to ask for commitment. And I'm saying, if we're going to do, if we're going to do this, whatever it is we're going to do, it's going to take commitment, not just good ideas and not just talkers. And, um, but love, will be uh, tested and we have to learn to forgive. We have to learn to be patient with people because when they do rub us up the wrong way, if we've got, still got a wrong way to be rubbed up, we have to remember that God accepts us and he's patient with us with our faults. And how many people are having to be patient with me or you in church because of your faults and they are being patient with us? And you're like, come on, let's make it easier for them. 
let's change let's let's ask the holy spirit to this is not just eternal life this is our internal life he wants to transform us from the inside out church is a great idea and uh you know even to be a church leader you've got to be good at bringing your own family up because it's like a family but it gets bigger than a family or if it's a big it's an extended family uh you know there's just so many people and it needs leaders that can lead well and if a church is going to be successful it needs followers not just leaders but it does need leaders and it needs followership and not just fellowship you know where you, you can be you have you're teachable you, you can be led by the leaders and uh, we have to learn that even the bible says you know don't make it difficult for your leaders for those who work hard amongst you you know because what what reward is there in it for the, for you if if you make it miserable for them and it's like yeah it's so true whoever wrote that in the book of hebrews really understood some things um but i want to finish with a, a story in the gospels of a woman and she's one of my favorite characters in the bible because she had a, a daughter who had an evil spirit that kept tormenting this little girl and uh she went to Jesus, but you see, she wasn't a Jew. And Jesus' mission was to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. And so, so he, he, uh, she pretended to be a Jewess, but she was a Syrophoenician woman. In other words, she wasn't a Jew, but she pretended to be a Jew. I don't know, I don't know what that was. Well, she put a veil up there and went, la, 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 la. I don't know what she did. But Jesus cut right through it and she said, Lord, will you, will you heal my daughter? And he says, it's not right to throw the, the children's food to the dogs, to give the children's bread to the dogs. You see, Jews looked at Gentiles in those days uh, uh, wrongly, but they said they called them Gentile dogs. They were so superior, they got so superior in their mind. Some of them, not, not all of them. And Jesus used that to this woman. What he was saying is, you're a Gentile. He wouldn't put up with somebody being fake. But he went, and there, most people, most women, most men, I'd have walked away probably. You know, it's not right to give the children's bread to the dogs. And uh, she could have took offence at that point and left. And she didn't, you know what she did? She says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from the children's table. And Jesus was thrilled because he was testing her and he said what an answer because of your answer he said go your daughter as well and her daughter got healed and I want to say this many people leave churches in life and they leave because of an offense it's so easy to be offended Jesus said offenses will come and it's so easy to be so small-hearted that you you can't overlook an offense the proverbs in the old testament say a wise man overlooks an insult and we have to do that. We have to learn to do that. That shows that you're big on the inside. I've got tough uncles uh, that know how to fight. They did. They're old men now, but in the day, back in the day, they were teddy boys and stuff like that. But here's the thing. What I noticed with them is they were easily offended. Somebody only had to insult them a little bit and they wouldn't put up with it. They'd have to knock them out. Offences will come. And this woman was offended and Jesus was testing her. And as he tested her, she passed the test. And I, you know what I'm thrilled for? The little girl. Because she didn't take the offence and take a ball on, metaphorically, you know, just walk off and say, I'm not playing. She stayed because of her daughter. And the next generation received Jesus' blessing. Supernatural came on their natural because the mother didn't take offence. And I've seen so many people leave church because of offence. They've left my church, but they've left other churches. I've seen, I've, I've been around long enough. And they are not thinking about the next generation. And I'm looking for robust people. You might come to me weak, but I will make you. My team will make you robust. We will strengthen you from God's word, from the scriptures. And so that you're not easily offended. And the next generations come into the full blessing of God on their life. We build church. We're not just church planters. We are church builders and we build people up. We build up families. We build up communities and we're God's gift 
to you if you'll let us be. I've said a lot, but the Holy Spirit wants, you know, he wants to fill you every single day and he will lead you into fellowship with each other and then to, together we're on Jesus's mission to bring God's love and God's wisdom to a world that hasn't got it and so that God's super can come on their natural and we can find success in marriage, success in bringing up families, success in communities, success in business, success in all what we put our hands to. Psalm 1 verse 3, whatever he does, whatever the blessed person does, prospers. I want us to have a prosperous life. So good. All right, I finished. Why not choose today to say yes to Jesus and come into his church? You can say this prayer. We say this every week, give people uh, the opportunity to give their lives to Christ. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus. Thank you that he was obedient to you and he died on the cross to take away my sins. And now ask for your forgiveness and I receive by faith your eternal life. I open the door of my life to you and I invite the Holy Spirit to come into me. And I say, Holy Spirit, will you make Jesus real to me? And will you set me free from my past? Give me a new start. Amen. If you said that prayer, get in touch. That'll be brilliant. We can help you and, uh, you know, uh, get some materials to you to help you on your way. But if you notice here, we always have the global sign, global church. Our mission is making disciples, planting churches, reaching cities. Wherever you're listening to from today, get in touch with us and say, I want to be trained. I want to be part of your team. I want to be part of your mission, part of your church. And uh, we can train you and, um, and we can equip you so that we can spread this beautiful, beautiful gospel around the world. Isaiah said, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him. Or how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. And uh, that's what I want us to do. I want Global to do that. We are real. We're very relational. We're relevant, but we are robust. And uh, stick with us and we will do you good. I've said enough. Have a great week. And I'll see you later. Thanks, Dave. Another great message there. You know, if you responded this morning or you wanted to respond, then please do get in touch with the person who invited you or drop us a line on the information below. Now, you might be wondering where I am and uh, what's all this stuff behind me. We wanted to give you a little sneak peek uh, at what we're planning for the Christmas event on the 20th of December. We're down at the Rock Tech studio and we have got some awesome things lined up for you. So we wanted to just remind you, get it in your diary, the 20th of December. We're going to be watching this in smaller watch parties and it is going to be live on YouTube. So get inviting your friends' church and come on, let's get into the Christmas it together.